Good morning, Capital City Church. Uh, this is Pastor Rick Mellick, and I'm here with Pastor Jared Matheny and Pastor Andy Korb. And it's a privilege to be with you today. As you know, we have suspended temporarily our public worship services due to the threat of the spread of the coronavirus. We feel like it's socially responsible and probably biblically uh, responsible as well to try to protect those who are more at risk in our society. And so it's a privilege for us to partner with our government, Kim Reynolds, our governor, and um, um, what's our mayor's name? Frank County. Is Frank County, of course, he is, uh, to partner with him as as well to make sure uh, that we do our best to keep everyone safe. And so this morning, we're going to be bringing the message in a little different format. We tried it in the main room, and it was just weird. Uh, without you guys there, empty seats, it just wasn't the same. I love speaking to you, to talk with you. And the empty room, boy, it was just a mood killer. I watched Jimmy Fallon this week. Maybe you guys did too. But when they removed his live audience, uh, him, as, as talented as he was, was Pretty bad, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. That was pretty pretty lame. He even knew it and was throwing the cards. Throwing over. the card, Right. So if he had a hard time, then why would we think we'd be any different, right? Right. Absolutely. Yep. So by this time, we're in Abraham's life, and we're knee-deep at least, maybe even waist-deep into the life of Abraham. And we are following his journey of faith. Now, we know that from the very beginning of his, uh, at least the recorded part of his life, when God called him uh, out of Ur of the Chaldeans, that God called him. And the Bible tells us that before he even knew God, he responded in obedience. Mm -hmm. That he took that first step of faith, and as he began to learn what it meant to follow God, he had all sorts of experiences. And by this time in our story, we've seen him fail in ways that we can relate to, mm -hmm. succeed in ways that made us proud, and more than anything else, we've watched God be faithful and true to his promises, regardless of whether Abraham deserved it or not. Now, we're moving ahead in our study because there's a lot to the life of Abraham, and we just have eight weeks to cover it. And so if you follow along with your notes, and by the way, Pastor Jared pushed a PDF file to your app that has our sermon notes from today or our discussion notes, and also the questions for your city groups that you'll be covering this evening and on Wednesdays. But if you refer to your notes, you'll see that we're skipping chapter 17, 18, 19, and 20. But I want to give you an update or a little bit of a recap as to what happens. Now, we know, uh, Jared, that in chapter 17, God met with Abraham. And um, God changed Abraham's name to Sarah. That God reminded Abraham of his promise of a son. And he also established the covenant or ritual of circumcision. Andy, do you know anything about circumcision? No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't, don't answer that. We'll talk more about circumcision later in the in the uh, the morning time together. So, chapter 18, Abraham had three visitors. Now, the cool thing about these three visitors is that many people believe that one of them actually was uh, the pre-incarnate Jesus, a Christophany, that Christ Himself had appeared to Abraham, and Abraham recognized how special these visitors were. He called his wife Sarah, and they both brought together uh, all the well, they pulled out all the stuff hospitality to the max. These three people told them again, you're going to have a child. As a matter of fact, they looked at Sarah and they said, next year, this time we're going to come back. And when we come back, you're going to have a boy. You'd be a parent. Well, she laughed because she didn't believe him. So the story moves on. Chapter 19, we have Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I was actually at a chiropractor appointment not too long ago, and I was talking to my chiropractor about the series that I am uh, teaching through right now. That's the problem of having a pastor as a friend or a client is I'm pretty one-dimensional. I like to talk about what I do. And, and I said, have you ever heard of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? And she said, no, I've never really heard of it. And so I said, let me tell you about it. So I started telling her the story of what happened from the beginning all the way to the end when we find Lot, you know, in the mountains with his daughters and you know the predicament. Yeah. And by the time I was done talking, there were several people in the office who had kind of gathered around. And I'm like, guys, you got to come to church because this story will just blow the hair right off of your head. So we're skipping that today. But after Easter, we're going to come back and spend three or four weeks just working through this story. Genesis 20, we're also skipping today. But this was another time where we see Abram stumble in a way that, well, disappointed us. He once again asked his wife, Sarah, to lie about her identity and to say that she was Abraham's sister. And you know the story. She did. And once again, another man, Abimelech, took Sarah to be his own wife. And almost the same situation that happened previously happened again. 
Have you ever offered your wife up to save your own skin, Pastor Jared? I, uh, I cannot say that I have. I don't, I don't think that would work out well. You wouldn't yeah. need God to save you yeah, because yeah. you'd be dead long before he had Absolutely. the chance to be yeah. able to do that. And we know the same is true, true for you. Um, but he did it again. And, you know, once again, God rescued Sarah. He brought sickness to the household of Abimelech. And interestingly enough... Um, Abraham was called a prophet for the very first time here. And God asked Abraham to pray for Abimelech and to pray that he would be healed. And sure enough, even though he had lied once again, even though he had disappointed God and disappointed us, probably disappointed his wife, we see God blessing him. Yeah. And the theme of this life of faith is repeated, that no matter what happens to us, God keeps his promises. And that he's faithful, even, and almost sometimes especially when we don't deserve it. And so this brings us to chapter 21, and let's read this scripture together. Chapter 21. Andy, would you start us off? Sure. It says, uh, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God has commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Kind of a cool thing here as I'm thinking about it is this is not the first time that Sarah laughed that when Sarah was told by the three men back in a couple chapters earlier that she was going to have a child, she laughed at him. But the language, the Hebrew language, teaches us that when she laughed that time, it was out of disbelief and almost scorn. This time when she laughed, it was out of pure joy and delight. We're going to come back and talk about that in just a second. So the first point that I want to bring to you or to point your attention to is the fact that God always keeps his promises. And in an ever-changing world, we serve a never-changing God. And keeping your word is really important in our world today. And many people disappoint us, but God never disappoints. And I really was focusing on the passage of Scripture here in Genesis 21, 1 through 7, when the Bible tells us that the Lord was gracious to Sarah, just as he had said he would be. And the Lord did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. God makes a lot of promises to us. And there's a particular promise in the New Testament that I was thinking about because of all of the things that were going on right now in our world with the threat of the coronavirus, with the stock market taking a huge hit and then not, and then taking a huge hit again with the rest of the complicated issues that we're facing you know, in the news and in our world today. I was thinking about the promise that comes to us in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus tells us to relax. He says, you don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. What do you think people are really worried about right now, Jared? You mentioned the stock market, the 401k, that kind of stuff, your retirement stuff. If, if, you, if you're near retirement, seeing that go up and down, it's got to be kind of worrisome you know, to see that. Right. Yeah. How about you? I think people, it seems at least that people are less worried about themselves getting physically sick and more worried about the... The catastrophe would be to not have their paycheck or or not be able to pay bills or, again, the market crash and all those different things. It seems like that's a, a more common theme than actually thinking mm -hmm. the coronavirus is something to be scared of personally for, mm -hmm. for most people. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of concern and a lot of worry. I have a son who's 24, almost 25, and uh, he called me yesterday and he said, Dad, he said, I can't find any toilet paper. And I said, son, you're not supposed to hoard toilet paper. I said, you don't, you don't need to hoard it. He goes, I'm not hoarding toilet paper. He goes, Eden forgot to buy it, and I don't have any in the house. He said, i got to go to the bathroom. So he was driving to Walmart and all the different stores trying to find toilet paper. I said, look, go to the church, go to the neighbor's house, yeah. You know, try a rest stop. You'll find yeah. some toilet paper. They're not too hard to get off the rack. Um, but he even had concerns, you know, and, of course, they were pretty short-sighted. But, you know, the world and the situation in the world is uh, is concerning him. The promise of God found in Matthew chapter 6 is that we don't have to worry about ourselves. Therefore, I tell you, this is from Jesus himself on one of the most famous sermons or from one of the most famous sermons in the Bible, says, do not worry about your life. Don't worry about what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. 
They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? You know, birds are a common theme, you know, here in, in our society. But back in Jesus' day, when Jesus was giving this sermon, people were well familiar with birds because Palestine was almost a highway for bird traffic. It was a little conduit there where so many birds would migrate back and forth that oftentimes you'd look up at the sky and it would seem to be dark because of all of the birds flying through. The Israeli army, more people have been killed uh, pilots have been killed in the Israeli uh, Air Force by birds hitting their pl- uh, engines and their jets than by enemy fire and in combat. And so this was an illustration that they certainly would have been tracking with. And in verse 27, Jesus said, can any one of you worry or by worrying at a single hour to your life? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about today, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Andy, there's a song that uh, is written using verse 33 of Matthew 6. Have you ever ever heard that one before? Sure. Oh, yeah. As our worship pastor, you want to oh, yeah. sing it oh, for boy, everybody yeah. right now? Um, so, Seek Ye First was kind of like that typical campfire song that you sang when you were going to Seek Ye First, the kingdom of God. And there's the hallelujah echo part. Right. Jesus is the answer. All those different things. Right. Throw in there. Yeah. You know, I sang that as a kid. Did you sing the same song as a child or is this? Uh, no, I, I think I know that one. Maybe, you think you, you, I, think I think you know so. it? I think I know that one. I sang it so many times I didn't pay any attention <laughs> to the words. You ever have, you know, songs like that or scriptures that you just repeat them so often right. and you really fail yeah. to, to grasp the significance? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Andy wants you to sing the, no, uh, the we'll, song. We'll, we'll pass it another time. All right. Another, another time. time. But this really is the command and also the promise wrapped up in that one particular verse in verse 33 of Matthew 6. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, you don't have to worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, many of us um, are healthy. We have been blessed with healthy children. And as you mentioned, the coronavirus isn't, uh, you know, really uh, concerning to us, even though we never know what's going to happen from a health perspective. But just because we may not be as concerned for ourselves, it certainly doesn't mean that there are people around us who aren't concerned. And, you know, as we know, there are many, you know, older adults with compromised immune systems, children that, you know, struggle and have issues. And it's a scary time uh, as a parent to know that, that you, you know, have a child that might be affected or having loved ones. And I think that's probably on a lot of people's minds. I certainly know that it's on my mind and my heart. What's it mean to you, Andy, when Jesus says in his own words, if you put his kingdom first, all that you need is going to be given to you. And you don't even have to worry about tomorrow, that tomorrow will take care of itself, that God's in control. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I I know that um, uh, there's another passage, and I forget exactly where it is in the Bible, where it says that God is going to give us everything we need to do every good work he's prepared for us but so often we want more than that and and when you take this verse out of context it's easy to say hey if i seek first god's kingdom he's going to give me a bunch of stuff but but what it's actually saying is the needs that i have are going to be met by god and i don't have to worry about those things if i'm just worried about doing the things that he's given me to do that's right in his kingdom yeah what do you think yeah i think a lot of that especially when we uh when we focus on on god's kingdom when we focus on uh, serving him the things that that he wants for us uh, he changes our heart in the way the things that we want mm-hmm. um, and again we we uh, experience a lot of sac- satisfaction and contentment with um, our needs being met in the, the way that God provides for us that's right in this passage in this particular sermon Jesus addresses things that the the people who heard this the first time would really be tracking with 
um, you know, clothing even was a necessity. You know, he wasn't talking about, you know, a brand new suit and, you know, something to show off and, and where to impress other people. He was talking about something to protect you from the elements. He's mm -hmm. talking about the basic needs of life. And, you know, they didn't have stores and, you know, there were many people who struggled with poverty in Jesus' day. And so his message, this sermon was particularly relevant. And he gives three reasons why you don't have to be afraid. And these are straight from the promises of Jesus Christ himself, who we know is God promises of God. The first reason he says is because you have a heavenly father. Now the concept of father is a hard one for some people. It all depends on how you were raised in your own experience, but to know that we have a heavenly father who cares and who's in control to me brings a lot of confidence. When I say to you, God controls all of the billions of contingencies in life to bring about his plan. How does that make you feel? Uh, there's a lot of comfort in the in the unknown. There's there's a lot of things in our individual lives. Uh, sometimes, you know, again, I'm thankful for the health that we have. But occasionally, when you have bumps in the road and those different things, um, we can look back in confidence and see the things that God has where He's taken care of us and and find assurance as we uh, we move forward. We know He has the plan. We know He sees how this is going to turn out. Right. And uh, we we're, we take uh, comfort in that, and it assures us that that He knows He's He's got it He's got it under control for us. Right. Andy, if I were to say to you that not only does God control all of the billions of contingencies in life to bring about his plan, but that he has answers to all of the information, there's nothing that he doesn't know. Does that bring you comfort? Um, yeah, it has to, because um, I don't know much of anything, you know, and, um, and if I don't have to, that's better, you know, like mm -hmm. if, I, if I know where the source of, of all those things are, um, I, can, I can put my faith there rather than having to have the answers myself. Sometimes it's hard to say, I don't know, to be able to just acknowledge, you know, I don't know, but yeah. to say, I do know the one who does know, right. and that's all that matters. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans that God works or causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And we know that God works good things and bad things together, that he causes all things to work together. You know, we're facing some bad things right now in our world today. And even though we're not afraid, it can be concerning. Mm -hmm. And so to know that God is in control, that he has all of the billions of contingencies in life that seem out of control to us perfectly mm -hmm. within his hand, that there are no questions he doesn't know the answer to, no information that he doesn't have, uh, grounds me in that reality that I don't have to worry about tomorrow, that tomorrow will take care of itself because we know that God is the God who's in charge of tomorrow, just like he is today. The second thing that it teaches us, the Bible teaches us in Matthew 6, is that we have a faith. Now, it's interesting because Jesus is talking about a peekaboo faith here. He's talking to, to the people who are listening to him, primarily the disciples, and he's saying to them, you used to have faith. So if you're worried about things like, you know, your provisions, hoarding toilet paper, trying to frantically find more hand sanitizer than any 10 people could ever use in a five-year period of time, uh, if you're worried about all this stuff, where did your faith go? It reminds me of a time when the disciples were, you know, in a storm and, and Jesus sort of teased them. And he was like, hey, you used to believe that I could control the weather and nature. How come you're scared now? Um, he's talking about a peekaboo kind of faith. And he's saying, remember the faith, the faith that I've given you that was built to sustain the tests and the storms of the times that we may be going through. Remember it. So how does your faith help you weather the storms of what we're going through even today or modern times? Um, again, I think it's, for, for me at least personally, there's a lot of the, the looking back at what God has done and, and how he has brought us through uh, previous situations. Um, and again, there's, you know, don't, don't have the time and stuff today for it, but, but I, have a, I have a load of stories of, of times where God has brought us, our family, uh, my wife, our kids through different situations, and I can trust the fact that he took care of us then, he will do it the same thing. Again, we know his character, we know who he is, and how he wants to handle these things, and so he, he will take care of us, and we just rely on that. So if I say um, that Jesus was teasing them about a peekaboo kind of faith, have you ever experienced a time when you've had to look back on your past and go, wait a second, God was faithful then, so what am I worried about right now? Um, for sure, yeah. I mean, I even specifically think of a time in college where I, I every every so often would come home and, and work for a year and then go back and trying to pay as I, I went. And there was a few times where I'd find out someone's just gifted the exact amount I needed and, and such like that. And so when, when it came time for us to decide, am I going to continue 
um, pursue and build a business or, or go to work in the kingdom the way that God has called me to do. It was just kind of like, I'm, I'm not my family's provider. God is, right? And I, I think as men, we struggle with that a lot of the time. Yeah. Where, where we go, I have to provide, you know, but God's, God's our provider and he's faithful. So, yeah, yeah, I've been there. So the second reason that we don't have to worry is that not only do we have a Heavenly Father who's in control, but we have a faith that's built to help us withstand these tests or or trials of life. The third thing that Jesus points out is that we have a future, and this future is one that was immediate, but it was also distant. And sometimes we get really concerned about what's going to happen tomorrow because we can't control it. We, well, if you're like me, you have issues of control where you like to be able to think you're calling the shots and have some idea of what may happen, you know, in the next few hours or days. Uh, They were no different. Jesus' audience, his disciples, they liked to think that they wanted to know and, and they had to trust that God controlled their immediate future. But there's also a promise here that's implied and mentioned that there's an eternal future, that there's a home in heaven for us. That even if the worst happens here on this earth, which is we lose our lives, that we instantly awaken to the reality of heaven. And we see Jesus Christ with his hand outstretched saying, hey, you're home. Welcome home. And that was comforting to the disciples. They don't have to worry. A promise from God. You don't have to be afraid. I always keep my promises. You have a heavenly father. You have a faith that's built to help you withstand these terrible times. And you have a future that's guaranteed. So you don't have to worry. Well, I love that. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Well, the second thing, if you refer back to your notes that we see here from Genesis, is that God's timing is always perfect. But sometimes it's frustrating. Uh, Sarah became pregnant, and she bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time that God had promised. Now, I struggle with God's timing so much, but Abraham really struggled with God's timing. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest challenges Abraham had was he tried to help God. Can you remember a time over the last few weeks where he tried to help God a little bit with his timing, trying to hurry up God's answers and his promises? Absolutely. Yeah, one of the I think one of your first weeks here you talked about where he stopped at the trees that were known for kind of being a symbol of fertility. Right. And there he 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 prayed to God and he the desire there, as you discussed, was that he was hoping to kind of help along the fertility and that that was going to pick up and that mm-hmm. he was going to help God to uh, provide that son. Right. So instead of being decades later, like God finally, when he answered his his, yeah. his promise, uh, he was trying to make it happen just in a few months. Sure. So yeah. what about yeah. another episode uh, or incident? Yeah, yeah. yeah and I honestly thought that maybe that would be where, where Jared headed, but it's uh, the, the obvious one that we've all kind of heard about, I would think, and, and especially in the last couple of weeks if you've been here, is uh, he said... I just sleep with your handmaid. Actually, it was, I think it was Sarah's idea, right? Sarah yeah. suggested yeah. Sarah, it. Yeah. Sarah was like, you can sleep with her. <laughs> and he was like, is this a test? <laughs> it's a test. It's no, a but he didn't say that. He was just like, okay. Yeah. So right. apparently it was But in her mind, it was a test. Pretty normal. Like, yeah. 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 Talk about a dis- that, dysfunctional but. family. Again, in our in our own homes, that would never fly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, you, uh, anyway, we digress. Uh, absolutely. I mean, Abraham had learned by this time that God's timing was God's timing and that it did not matter how much he wanted to push God for answers, um, that God was going to do what was right when it was right and that the point of learning to walk this life of faith was waiting well mm-hmm. and trusting God as he develops character. We talked last week in the message that uh, that I delivered uh, that very few things that are worthwhile are done in a hurry or built in a hurry. That character is developed over time. Mm-hmm. And that's a really hard lesson to learn because we live in a world that wants everything fast. Mm-hmm. But the second point here from this story is that God always, first of all, answers his or, or fulfills his promises and, and secondly, that his timing is perfect, even though it's sometimes frustrating. And I think some of my most um, passionate conversations with God have involved his timing. God, how come you're not hurrying up? You're taking too long. You're not listening. Again, from last week's message, time's running out. Nobody cares, right? Yep. Uh, all hope is lost. We get so dramatic and we fail to remember that God is the God who has all the information Right? He's the God who controls all the circumstances. We're the ones who have to learn to trust and to obey, to seek his kingdom first, not our own. The third point here in our notes is coming straight from Genesis 21, chapter or verse 4. And the point is this. God's faithfulness brings about our loving obedience. Mm-hmm. Now, depending on how you were raised, Jared, um, sometimes we were taught to fear God 
and to fear the consequences of what God may do to us if we didn't obey. Mm -hmm. But what Abraham was learning here is that God blesses, even though he's a bonehead half the time, or maybe more than half the time, and because God had blessed him and been so faithful and rescued him, we see Abraham obeying, doing exactly what God had asked him to do. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him just as God had commanded him. And he did it out of love for God and gratitude. Circumcision is a theme that we see a lot in the Old Testament. And we certainly aren't going to get into it too, uh, in too much of a detailed way here. But in the Old Testament, circumcision was similar to baptism in some ways, where it was an outward sign of an inward commitment to be obedient to God. Now, there are many passages in Deuteronomy and Leviticus particularly that talk about the importance of circumcising the heart and making sure that it's not just an outward kind of obedience to God that we demonstrate, but an inward obedience. Mm -hmm. I obey God because I love him. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, kind of an environment did you grow up in and which perspective were you, uh, you know, sort of uh, familiar with as a, as a kid? Yeah, a lot of times there was, uh, you know, the kind of the fear of God. There was the, the fact that if we did things wrong, God was looking over our shoulder and, and we were going to get in trouble. And that was sort of one of the ways to compel us to behave and, mm -hmm. and to, uh, you know, get along. I, you know, I've got uh, nine siblings. And, and so for us to get along, uh, there was a, a, a big, hey, God's watching. you got to watch out. You know, okay. and, and you kind of end up with this fear of God. And uh, it wasn't until I was older that I realized that that fear of God wasn't necessarily terror. Right. And, uh, you know, just, you know, constantly looking over my shoulder to see right. what he was going to do to me. <laughs> Jesus is coming, look busy. Right. How about you? Yeah, I, I would say that I, I grew up in a situation where I often didn't do wrong things just because I was afraid of the consequences that would, that would come to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't even know that that was necessarily intentionally instilled mm -hmm. in us. Um, but like uh, intentionally with my kids now, I, I want them to be moved to obedience because they love mom and dad, mm -hmm. because they because they love God, because they recognize that what God says is best, that we, we trust him more than we're scared that we're not going right. to please him, you know. Even as a parent, it's so much better when our kids, when they obey because they love us and they want to please us, not because they're scared of being punished. And that's another thing that God was teaching Abraham in this life of faith. And then finally, we see in Genesis 21, 6 and 7, that loving obedience really brings true happiness. And after all, that's really what we want is to be truly happy. Mm -hmm. Sarah said in verse 6, God has brought me laughter. Now, again, this time's different than chapter 17. This is pure joy. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Loving obedience brings our true happiness. So the principles here are pretty simple. First of all, God always keeps his promises, mm -hmm. and that's really, really important. God's timing is always perfect, but even though sometimes it can be frustrating, God's faithfulness brings about loving obedience in us. And when we finally choose to obey out of love to God, we find true happiness and true joy. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of the things that we worry and struggle for, that we spend so much time concerning ourselves over, will be given to us and that we find ourselves truly at peace and truly at home in this world. Let's pray together. Thank you for joining us this morning. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've had here to investigate your word. And I pray for our country right now. I pray for our world. I pray for our leaders, for our city. I pray that you would, first of all, give wisdom and discernment, that you would allow the correct measures to be taken to help stop the spread of this virus that has so many so concerned, that the panic that's going on across our world and with our people, Father, that you would help bring peace instead of panic, that the disorder that we feel would be returned to order. We know you're in control. You have all of the billions of contingencies in this life, right in the palm of your hand. You know everything, even before it happens. There is no information not available to you. And I pray, Father, that you would bless our country, bless our city, and bless our church. Give us the opportunity to be able to stand for the right kinds of things in the middle of this crisis. The crisis of another is a call to action, Lord. And I pray that you would use Capital City Church and each of us to be able to stand up and to serve the people who are around us, giving instead of taking, not focusing on ourselves, but focusing on others, because that's what Jesus would do. We love you. We thank you. We're grateful. In Jesus' name.